here we are at the headquarters of Mausier. So we thought, since there aren't really many concerts happening right now, at least not in, in real life, we thought we would make some entertaining videos, talk about instruments and music and whatnot. We'll see how that goes. This is our first one. And we thought a good uh, first subject of inquiry could be this beautiful harpsichord that uh, just joined the, the crew. Um, what can you tell us about it right now? Well, um, it's indeed uh, the latest uh, acquisition here for the studio. Uh, it was about a year ago that I um, got, uh, got a message from people in Hamburg who were trying to sell an instrument, uh, but it, it was not uh, like it's often the case that people try to get as much as possible money for an instrument or they just want to get rid of it because they can't make use of it anymore. Right. Uh, they were very, um, uh, very concerned to bring the instrument to a, to a good place. Um, because the owners were very good friends with the maker, mm -hmm. Bernd Fischer, who made this instrument for them in the mid 80s, 1980s. Uh, and the instrument wasn't, hadn't been used uh, very much. The family had bought it more to support actually Bernd Fischer. Who so were they musicians themselves? Or? No, they were yeah. not musicians. Okay. I think one of them was a music teacher actually in uh, high school. But they th uh, at the time they bought the instrument, they thought maybe uh, some of our children would make use of it, but not much of that happened in the end. Yeah. So when I first saw it um, last spring, it was almost like unused. It had been played for a couple mm -hmm. of hours, I guess, or maybe 15 hours or so. Wow. So uh, although 35 years old, very new. And um, well, I had to get used a bit to it in the beginning. It wasn't love at first sight. Well, at sight maybe yes, because it's it's an amazing instrument. You immediately see the quality of the, the yeah. materials and yeah. the, the, the woodwork and everything. But um, it was a little over voiced, so all the plectra were really it's quite right. quite hard. Yeah. So it was uh, qu quite an aggressive sound. But well, we worked a bit on that and I tuned it a few times and then bit by bit I started to become totally obsessed with it actually. Uh, yeah. Never had that before. I, I once dreamed about this instrument. Wow, okay. Yeah, it really appeared in a dream, both uh, me playing it and, and hearing it and seeing it. Yeah. So, uh, no, then in the end we were able to, uh, what's, what's the expression, strike a deal. Right, strike a deal, yeah. Strike a deal. And, uh, <coughs> Yeah, since, uh, what is it, April or May, it's, it's now here. <coughs> in the meanwhile, we, uh, uh, we've put new strings on it. Uh, yeah, I saw some uh, fascinating pictures and I think also some videos that uh, Dale sent me of the revoicing process and all the breadcrumbs and... Yeah, that was a trick that Peter Jan Belder uh, knew. Uh, if you use fresh white bread... Uh, is there a particular date for you? <laughs> That's ideal material to sort of rub rub off the the soundboard and all the yeah. the grey dirt and then the dust that thirty five years of goes into the pores of the of the wood. You can really take that off and take it out. So, so yeah, it's it's really strong. The next step is to voice it with quill. It still has mm -hmm. the uh, original, so to say, uh, Delrin plectra in it, made softer, but. Uh, yeah, I think the new streaming already uh, was an important improvement to the instrument. Well, it sounds as if it was a bad instrument to begin with. It was a great instrument to begin with, but it, it, it's so spectacular. It really deserves uh, the very best right. setup possible in terms of stringing and then later voicing to, to bring out its marvels yeah. in the most magnificent way. And what about the builder? Because that's it's not a name I've uh, actually ever heard uh, before. I don't think he's super well known no true that most colleagues i i, I, I speak to Bernd fischer no it's a name yeah. few people know he is a bit better known in the english 
uh, British harpsichord scene because that's right. where he, he studied worked. And yeah, and also he studied and worked yes. for most of his life. So he is actually, he was born in Dresden in the last days of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And then his parents uh, took him and his little brother uh, to Bavaria, where he grew up, and became, first of all, became a, a wood technician. He was a specialist in how to treat wood, as paints or wax and oil, and yep. that kind of the surface of wood. Um, that was still in, in Germany, right? That was still in Germany, in, yeah. yeah. In the East, yeah. But then he, uh, he, he was a, a very musical, uh, musically interested, played the violin himself. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit of the dolmetsch uh, uh, picture here. Right. But then he discovered, uh, or actually it was a friend of, of him who asked him if he could uh, assemble a uh, kit. Mm -hmm. And that was a success and he did it the second time. It's how many, many people got into Hopsiford building and, and playing for that matter. But then after having built two kits, he, um, he decided that that was going to be his uh, vocation. Uh, in life, so he he then looked for a good address, a good workshop to uh, well to really learn the trade, and he ended up in uh, Finchcox, the Finchcox collection. Yeah. In oh. I never know how to pronounce that name. Goudhurst, Goods, Goudhurst, G O U D. Yeah, it's like the Dutch word for gold, goud. Yeah, but I'm sure it's pronounced differently. Goudhurst, most likely. So he worked there, most likely, for uh, Derek Eppen and Richard Burnett, yeah. who together were running that uh, collection of instruments and workshop yeah. for restoration and building. Many, many very fine instruments were, were made in that uh, workshop. Yeah, of course. And as Derek Eppen uh, tells us, uh, Bernd Fischer was very important in, in all of that. So. Uh, he was regarded as the best technician there for he, he seems uh, the kind of behind the scenes yeah. kind of guy. He didn't it didn't seem like he really enjoyed being in the limelight, so in to the speak. Spotlights. No. Yeah. No, the word you see in in every little description, longer or shorter, of, of his life and his personality is uh, self effacing. Right. So he was all about the work, uh, and and felt uncomfortable when when it was about him or he never put his name on the instrument. Um, right. We, we found Which is also historical, no? The original uh, exactly. that was copied didn't have a name either. Exactly. We, we of course have to talk about uh, the original right. of this uh, copy. <coughs> but indeed, it's, it's, it's the so the historical accuracy. The, the name of uh, Bernd Fischer is on the soundboard on the underside with pencil and on two or three other parts of the instrument. So right. In the end, one can find out who made it, if, yeah. if you don't know. No, but he must have been a fascinating man. He uh, he died only a year ago, actually. Yeah, you never met him, right? No, never met him, unfortunately. But uh, he died just before I got to know this instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, Peter Jan Belder, my colleague in Arnhem, has a Rutgers copy. Okay. That was also mostly made by Bernd Fischer, but was sold, I guess, under the, under the name Atom and Burnett. Um, I see. Yeah, but like with many instruments from that workshop, most of the actual work was done by Bernd Fischer. Yeah, yeah, yeah really interesting. Shall we talk about the original then? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that's of course uh, the, the, the major part of, uh, of, of this instrument, the, the style in which it's made and the characteristics of its uh, sound and the way it plays and all. So <coughs> by the time uh, Bernd Fischer decided to to copy this instrument, which the original, which was then in England for restoration with Christopher Knobs. Okay. Um, in so he must have known the instrument quite quite well. Yes, and, and visited the knobs made of course uh, plans. measurements of all the parts and, yeah. and I don't know for sure, but I guess that uh, Bernd Fischer had access to, to yeah. the original. Yeah, uh, quite likely. Yeah, but back then it wasn't known who made that instrument. Right. <coughs> the original is now in Stuttgart, in the Landesmuseum. 
And some years later, uh, a very similar instrument was discovered, mm -hmm. which was, as you just said, signed somewhere on one of the keys, um, but was so very much the same in design and in lots of details that there, there's no doubt yeah. that it must be from the same maker or at least from the same workshop. So ever since we now can attribute this instrument to the original of this instrument to Claude Labrèche, who worked in the south east of France. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> he, he's from that region north of Nice, mm -hmm. Savoie. Uh, and, and the original was made uh, in Carpentras. Yeah. A small but important historical town. And so, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating type of instrument, uh, <coughs> style of making. Um, well, first of all, you could say it's, it's 17th century French, of course, which, is it, which it is. But there are many elements uh, <coughs> that maybe make it a bit different from contemporary instruments from Paris. The vicinity of uh, Italian influence is quite obvious in the way it's set up shape of the bridges uh, and other details. So yeah, it's a, it's a combination of uh, 17th century French uh, setup, the double manual concept of course is typical French, right. two eight foots and a four foot. Um, and what is the compass? The compass is uh, four and a half octaves, G to D, although we have uh, a missing uh, D sharp or A flat, mm -hmm. that's a note that in, in that period wasn't, wasn't used. It does not have the typical French short octave, which we see in instruments by Thibault or Vautry, right. which looks as if it goes down to a B natural, a low B, which actually sounds as a G, yeah. and then C sharp and E flat, those keys are used for A and B or B flat. Yeah. Sometimes also uh, split, so the yeah. second half of the, the backside of those keys would have the C sharp and E flat. Um, no, this has a chromatic bass octave all the way down to G without the G sharp. And it goes up to D. That's a little compromise uh, Bernd Fischer made when he made this instrument. Um, the original goes up to C, which is the typical top note for any 17th century French instrument, or German for that matter. Uh, but I must say it's not bad to have the, the high D as well. Uh, there's so much repertoire that that now is accessible. With of course, those yeah. extra notes. Yeah. So, <coughs> well, I maybe say a few more words about the instrument. It's at the moment tuned to around 400. Mm -hmm. So in between 392 or 390 and 415. Uh, which we know was an important uh, pitch area, so to say, between 400 and 405. Many wind instruments from the late 17th and 18th century uh, are found that have that pitch. Right. Flutes, for example. Um, <coughs> so who knows, maybe this instrument can also be used more and more for chamber music using that, that pitch. You have used it already for some chamber music, right? That they recorded uh, yeah. all of Bach with, exactly. uh, with Martin Rauch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did the A major yeah. flute sonata. Which worked really wow. nicely, yeah. yeah. That was still with the uh, original with the strings. Old, with the old strings, yeah. Yeah. I'm very happy with the new strings. Those are the ones made by Stephen Burkett from Canada. Yeah, that's the, another idea of perhaps a future conversation. To yes. So we do a Zoom call with uh, Stephen Burkett. With Waterloo. Yeah, I guess you, could, you have quite a lot of experience with other French, either original instruments from from the time, or or copies uh, of. How how would you describe it in comparison to some other instruments you know? Yeah, well, I don't have that much experience with seventeenth century French instruments, but the ones I I've seen or tried or played, uh, that is indeed Thibault uh, Vincent Thibault, who worked in Toulouse. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's uh, Vaudry, the Parisian maker, whose spectacular instrument is in, in London, Victoria and Albert Museum. What is the name of the collector in France who has quite a few of these 
instruments. Yeah, what's this is it? V U V V U, I think. Yeah, V V U. Yeah. I think again, we went, we went there. Yeah, yeah, in Ghana. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Well, I would say, maybe the most spectacular, spectacular, bad choice of word. Well, everything is spectacular about this instrument. The lit painting, which we should talk about as well. Yeah. Shall I briefly mention the difference with T1 yes. and Kurli? So, uh, a real difference between this instrument and the uh, instruments we know from T1 and Kurli is the size of it. So, it's uh, the instrument itself is about two meter, two and a half meters long, yeah. but since the stand sticks out quite a bit there at the tail end, right? The, the total length, if you're hiring a van to move it, uh, keep in mind you need 260 more or less. Okay. Yeah, and the V3 and also the instruments by Thibault are, uh, are really very compact, mm -hmm. actually much, much smaller. So this instrument has a spectacular length for the lowest bass strings, um, which partly, ex well, you can see the tail is very sharp. Right. That also is a... Uh, I guess that kind of puts it closer to Italian exactly, yeah. instruments. That's Especially in, in, in Napoli, uh, there, there, there were instruments were typically made with a long yeah. and, and very sharp tail end. Yeah. Uh, Thibault has this round ending, mm -hmm. so the double bent sides. And V3 has a more classical French. angle there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's um, it's quite quite different from the Parisian instruments. You know, also from uh, Denis mm -hmm. instruments from that uh, family of builders. Uh, those instruments are really tiny, small, and very compact. Yeah. Um, and here we have a really large instrument. Uh, one often reads reads about the original that it's uh, circa 1680. I would guess myself, but it's nothing more than a guess that it's actually a bit later. Mm -hmm. It is more uh, really built at the end of the 17th century or even around 1700. Mm -hmm. The builder lived until 1711. So. Yeah, it could, could have been built in 1710, but uh, yeah. Well, we can talk a bit about uh, the lid painting. Let me show you <coughs> the soundboard painting, which was actually done by uh, Derek Atom. Um, he calls it, it his opus one and only. And, uh, I think he's a bit embarrassed about it, but I think it's, it's really well done actually. Do you have his permission to show it? Yeah, <laughs> beautiful red red color here. But as you can see, um, many harpsichords have a lid painting, many of the rubbers harpsichords, for example, that covers the whole surface of the fully opened lid. But this is clearly in two parts. So one is supposed to look at this separately, maybe while having it open in such a way, or, or like that. Right, yeah. Very practical. Yeah, we have something to look at. This is a nice uh, scene at the inn here. I see large glasses of red wine. And well, here we have um, the main uh, ornamentation of the instrument because for the rest, the instrument is actually very sober. We just have a bit of uh, black lining here and there. A really beautiful. And of course, legs, yes. <coughs> the expression of the wood is, is, is wonderful. Yeah, I think yeah. this. These, the, the turning of these legs is wonderfully done. Very open and it's a real spiral going down. Yeah. Uh, but there is, for example, no rosette. There's no soundboard painting. So in a way, compared to some other instruments, it's very it's sober. sober yeah. Yeah. But then the full visual focus goes to the lit painting. It's very animated scene. Yeah, so Derek Atlum copied the painting that is in the original La Breche. Uh, which in itself is a copy or an arrangement of a painting by Francesco Albani, mm -hmm. Italian painter from Bologna. And interesting, the, um, his original was, is now in the Louvre in Paris. It was bought by Louis XIV in 1685. Wow, okay. Yeah. And probably the painter who arranged 
the painting of Albani made a, a, a version of it here on the original uh, Brecht. Probably didn't know the uh, original painting, but he might have been inspired by uh, engraving, engraving of the painting. Engravings, yeah, yeah, which were, happened. Which yeah. were circulating through, of course, yes. through the country. So maybe that's also an indication that uh, when the painting came to came to Paris in 1685 uh, and was then popularized by engravings and, and that then maybe in 1690 or 95, who knows, <coughs> the anonymous painter of this painting on the original instrument uh, yeah, was inspired by that. Yeah. And it's the story of uh, the nymphs of Diana uh, disarming th those cupids. You see, the cupids yeah. are sleeping. Yeah. And their arrows are taken away and, and, and burned there. At the Is there any connection to the, the other side, the, the inn scene? I don't think so, no. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a bit strange, both visually, it's uh, very disconnected, yeah. but also very different themes yeah. on, on both paintings. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> So we're taking a look now inside the instrument. Yeah. Which is a very beautiful, really beautiful craftsmanship. All the, the wooden details. Yeah, it's, it's really fabulous. I love this uh, sound well work here also. Um, very typical for 17th century French instruments is the mm -hmm. fact that uh, most of the case that's here, the cheek, the bent side and the tail, are of one kind of wood, in this case it's walnut. Yeah. But then the spine, this long uh, back side of the instrument, is of a different wood. Yeah. Uh, thicker, uh, a lighter wood, but uh, much thicker. This is only about seven millimeters. Also Italian, eh? like we discussed before. But then here there's this uh, really thick, solid spine which keeps it all together. Um, and yeah. that's the same thickness throughout. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no tapering there. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can see all the all the woodwork here. It's beautifully made. The, the little knobs here for the register uh, levers are wonderful. And this is the most practical jack rail I have in any of my instruments because if you need to oh, yeah. you need, just need to work a bit, you just slide it backwards. Perfect. Also. A bit like in many Italian instruments, but then uh, since it's straight, in most Italian instruments it's a bit angled. Yeah, you can just put it here and you can work on uh, whatever you need to do. And that's maybe nice to show. Um, I mentioned dog leg, so the dog leg register is the front one, the front eight foot that is controlled here by the upper manual. Right, but then have a look. The lower end of it uh, looks very different from a normal jack. Normal jack, well, this is actually... There are no normal jacks. No, no, yeah. <laughs> this looks like a mini dog leg. But yeah. here you see a normal jack that's the same width all the way down. So this end of it, the lower end of it, stands on the keyboards, in this case the lower keyboards. But this jack um, is cut in two, so to say, so it can actually be played both from the upper manual using this bit here. So the, the keys of the upper manual go until here and then lift the, the jack. But the lower manual can also uh, play it. And that happens when I shove this lower keyboard in. There's little pieces of uh, wood, there's a bit of felt on it, that reach right underneath that thinner end of the, yeah. of the jack. And so also from here. And it's interesting to, I don't know if we can hear that actually, but if you listen to the difference of this same front eight foot played here, from the upper manual, or, it's quite a bit different. Yeah, too. and of course it feels different too. Yeah. Because you have the a different. So it's much slower here. Yeah. Here it's more direct. Yeah. It's a bit uh, 
softer than. Almost and if you if you add the four foot to this sound, you get a very interesting combination of eight and four. <laughs> This actually sounds quite a lot like Venetian uh, 16th century harpsichords, which only had one eight and one four. Right. So this was the, the tutti sound of Venetian. <laughs> harpsichord was basically a Flemish instrument, right. modified to the French taste. Um, but in the whole 17th century, they had their own style of making, which is much more focused on quick declamation. Mm -hmm. um, and somewhat of a lighter character in the end. Although, well, the character is very strong, and very uh, direct, and as you hear, he's low. <laughs> But there's still a lot of air or sort of space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a spacious yeah. sound. And in yeah. Rupert's there is much more of a focus of a sustain and yeah, a, more a swell in the note. Yeah. So almost more organ-like. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. And the keys are quite uh, quite nice, no? With the the zebra. Yeah. Pattern. It's often called skunk tail. Skunk tail. Uh, sharps. You can maybe remove the name board here which has no name on it because of the, the no name board the no name board name board yeah here all the workmanship can be admired wonderful clean cut In most instruments if you would take out a piece like this it would be moving around or rattling or or you would be able to get it back in but here yeah. it's a perfect fit yeah, amazing. Yeah, and all the colors. Uh, you can see he was, as we discussed, this expert of um, uh, how to treat wood. Yeah. And all the beautiful shades of. Yeah, and showing all the, the grains, all the interesting yeah. sides. An important yeah. technical detail is uh, maybe to end with that that the soundboard, wood, the grain of it, uh, mm -hmm runs like that. So in most harpsichords it's parallel to the, the back of the instrument, the spine. Yeah. yeah. But here the whole thing is uh, shifted over a little bit. Yeah. 15 degrees or so. Which um, some builders say reinforces the lower frequencies Interesting, of, the, yeah. of the instrument, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, but is, is that a feature that's also on the original? Yeah. yeah. And it's seen in Italian instruments. Mm -hmm. more, more than anywhere else. Yeah. yeah, it might explain some of the strong character of the instrument. Yes, and then it's nice to see that uh, the end of the bridge, the eight-foot bridge, there are really 
disappears into the pointed end of the tail. In many instruments, of course, there's a, a bit of a curve. Yeah. Or in Italian instruments, uh, a mitered, is that a mitered, mitered yeah. angle. Here it just goes away like that. A feature that actually many uh, German instruments in the 18th century then copied from the French tradition. Right. Yeah. Do you want to have this little screw is so beautiful here? Yeah, a little. Um, reminds me of uh, French gardens. And, and you can you can uh, do that with the tuning hammer. Okay. Yes, of course. Fix or yeah. loosen, loosen it. Very clever. Using the tuning hammer. That's one thing I still have to arrange. The original has the tuning hammer hanging here. Oh, which of course is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, we'll make something for that. Now one more here. This. We did a bit of work on the instrument with Martin Kaver. Some balancing of the keyboard. A bit of lead had to be added. Yeah. Uh, in the back of the mainly the lower keyboard. But he was also uh, astonished by the well the workmanship and also how incredibly well everything still works. The precision, precision, precision also of this this work here. It's yes, both firm and precise, but, but smooth, but smooth and flexible. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys. Hopefully, we'll make more of these, and uh, see you again. Bye. Ciao.